This meeting is being recorded. This meeting is being streamed. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Shona Murray. I'm a journalist with Euronews in Brussels. Um, before I begin the formal proceedings, I want to advise you that the event is being live streamed. So anybody here in the audience, if you need to leave at any point, please do so uh, quietly and also keep your phones on silent if you don't mind. <clears throat> Minister for European Affairs, Peter Burke, European Ombudsman, Emily O'Reilly, distinguished members of the Oireachtas, MEPs, ambassadors and embassy representatives, representatives from the European Commission, European Parliament and Eurofound, the Irish Ombudsman, Jared Deering and other regulators, representatives from civil society and other advocacy groups, officials including from the Department of Foreign Affairs, joining us from both here and abroad, and to many people who are tuning in on social media for today's event. You're very, very, very welcome. 
Now, obviously, it's a very special welcome to Emily O'Reilly for taking her time out of her busy schedule to be with us here today. And of course, many thanks to Peter Burke, the Minister for European Affairs and Defence, for hosting us here today. Welcome, everybody, to this, the third and final in the series of EU50 Ivy House Lectures, a key element of the overall EU50 programme underway, marking Ireland's 50-year membership of the European Union. And I've been delighted to moderate this series the EU 50 Ivy House Lectures are part of the Department's ongoing series of Ivy House commemorative lectures held here since 2012. The aim is that this series of three EU 50 themed lectures during 2022 and 2023 was to feature high level speakers who may have held or currently hold significant roles in the European Union or on European Union matters. And I'm sure you'll agree that Emily O'Reilly as European Ombudsman very much fits that bill. Each of the EU50 lectures has covered significant themes relevant to Ireland's 50 years of membership and the next 50. For today's lecture, we're very pleased to welcome Emily O'Reilly, who will reflect on the EU today and Ireland's 50-year journey as a member state. And in terms of the running order, we'll start with some welcome remarks by Minister Peter Burke, and then we'll be followed by Emily's address. We'll have about 30 minutes for any of your questions, so please do send in your questions, and anyone who is... Uh, joining us from remotely, you can send in a question through Slido and I'll be able to uh, put them to Emily myself. So, Minister, I'd like to invite you to the podium to provide your introductory remarks. Thank you, Shona. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Ivy House for this last of the EU50 lecture series. It is certainly fitting that we close the Ivy House EU50 lecture programme with one of the most eminent Irish people working in the European Union today. Emily O'Reilly, the Ombudsman. Emily, you're very welcome here to Ivy House. Over the past year and a half, through the EU50 programme, we have sought to reflect on what Irish membership of the European Union has meant and what it will mean in the future. This has been communicated and carried out in many fora. We have held this Ivy House EU50 lecture series here for our youth. We hosted the My EU50 programme in primary, secondary and third level competitions. We have developed a travelling exhibition, which I hope you saw on your way in and is touring venues now nationwide and indeed right across our embassy network. And we have developed a special funding initiative for local authorities to hold public events next week, Europe Week. We have also held a number of conferences and events looking at the creation of health and the single market, to mention just a few aspects. A new European anthem project, which the department led together with the Department of Education, with primary and post-primary schools, has been heavily oversubscribed with almost 500 schools participating to learn and to play the European anthem in their schools in, a, in time for Europe Day next Tuesday, the 9th of May. And next Monday, as part of Europe Week celebrations, most ministers and EU ambassadors will also visit close to 100 schools around the country. Many thanks to some of our ambassadorial colleagues who are here today for agreeing to participate again in this very important event. On Tuesday evening, the Taunashta will host a gala concert featuring Beethoven's Ode to Joy with a choir composed of members from across the European Union and Ukraine on Europe Day in the National Concert Hall as a final to the EU50. It goes without saying that the EU has helped transform Ireland. Indeed, much of our EU50 programme has been about celebrating the positive impacts of EU membership on our economy, on our society and on our values. But we must also recognise that many achievements of Ireland in the European Union we have been proud to play a key part at key moments, such as the development of the Erasmus programme, welcoming 10 new EU member states during the Day of Welcomes on the 1st of May 2004. And since last year, we've been proud to stand steadfast in support for Ukraine and will continue to do so. But it is perhaps our people that have made the greatest impact, whether they be translators, lawyers, or the most senior policymakers, 
Irish people have been very much part of our shared European project, and none more so than Emily O'Reilly. It is therefore a great pleasure to be joined by Emily here today for this very special EU50 lecture. Previously, Emily was a very successful investigative journalist and later Ireland's first female ombudsman and information commissioner. She has brought this extensive and invaluable expertise to her office in Europe. It is an office which she has transformed, in particular by raising the public awareness of the role of the European Ombudsman across member states and through her support for the European Network of Ombudsmen. Under her stewardship, the European Network of Ombudsmen has steadily developed into a powerful collaboration tool for Ombudsmen and their staff serving as both an effective mechanism for close cooperation and case handling and an important tool for European Ombudsmen to enable her to deal promptly and effectively with complaints that fall outside her mandate. The, 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 the role of the Ombudsman is not without its challenges. It is a relatively small office given its responsibility for scrutiny of such a large array of EU institutions. In addition, these institutions have taken a considerable new responsibilities in recent years in response to the financial crisis, COVID-19, and most recently, the impacts of the war in Ukraine. During Emily's tenure in this office, she has become a much regarded and respected voice within the halls of power in Brussels. She's also developed key partnerships across the institutions and engages strongly with the general public. As European Ombudsman, she has a reputation for insisting on institutional accountability, transparency and good service to the citizen. Most recently, she successfully steered changes in the statute of the Office of the European Ombudsman through both the Council and the European Parliament. I want to congratulate her for her achievement for this enhanced role for her office. Finally, I want to thank Emily for all the support she has lent Irish initiatives within the EU over recent years, particularly during our presidencies. We are proud of your role and the role that you are playing at the centre of Europe in this year, which we celebrate 50 years of Ireland's membership of the EU. Gareth Mahagut. Minister, thank you very much for that. I'd now like to introduce Emily O'Reilly. Emily was first elected as European Ombudsman in July 2013, following the European Parliament elections. She was re-elected for a five-year mandate in December 2014 and again in December 2019. Previously, as we heard there, many of you will recall her as Ireland's first female Ombudsman and Information Commissioner. And obviously we shouldn't forget her role as a prolific investigative journalist before that. During Emily's tenure, there's been a steady increase in the profile and activities of the European Ombudsman's Office. More EU citizens are aware of the role of the Ombudsman and the work to defend citizens' interests. The main EU institutions have also become more responsive to the European Ombudsman's queries and reports, not least perhaps the European Parliament in its response to Qatargate. But I'll let Emily deal with that later on if she should, show, should wish. And um, we're very happy to have you here today in person, Emily, and I'm sure that everyone here in Ivy House, those who are viewing from Irish missions abroad, as well as the public who have tuned in on social media, are looking forward to hearing your remarks. And I'll invite you to the podium. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for those uh, lovely introductions. Um, I'd like to thank the Minister and the Department of Foreign Affairs for inviting me to speak to you here today as part of the celebration of and reflection on Ireland's 50 years of membership of what is now the European Union. There is no doubt, as the Minister has said, but that our membership of the Union has been the most radically transformative part of Ireland's modern history, as both the Taoiseach and the Taunashta have stated throughout this anniversary year. It turned the base metal of an infant, inward-looking, protectionist and conservative state into the free and confident republic that we now have. It enabled us to grow up, to think for ourselves, to inhabit our Irishness in a way that did not depend on rigid allegiances to old ideologies, but rather allowed the best of our unique national self to flourish. I see the respect that the Irish are afforded in the EU administrative 
and political sphere. We have joined the grown-ups table. We are no longer on the margins. But while I was thinking about what I would specifically talk about, I was in some ways trying to avoid a topic that in the end for me became unavoidable. I remembered a friend telling me once about the wonderful Titanic exhibition in Belfast and how the rather key moment for that ship and for its passengers, that is, its sinking, played, in his view, second fiddle to the exhibition's focus on the marvels of Belfast shipbuilding. So it was in that spirit of not avoiding the difficult parts of our history that I decided that I cannot not talk about the EU's past and present role in my life and the lives of every Irish woman. In my view, if the EU gave to the Irish state its effective liberation from the British state, so too did it give to Irish women our effective liberation from the Irish state. January 1st, 1973 was our Independence Day. This year, 2023, brings an end to the decade of remembrance of the events that laid the foundation of the state. Yet the Irish state, as a true republic, as a true democracy, did not become real, did not materialize for women until decades after its nominal legal creation. During this decade of remembrance, many have understandably embraced the soaring reverential narrative of the Republic that grew from the blood and the ashes of the rising, the war of independence and the civil war. We have rendered rather more opaquely the uglier narrative of female repression, female relegation to the domestic, female exclusion, even from the tiniest crevice of financial and political power. We have rendered rather more opaquely the reality of a state that denied its own revolutionary ideals until the EU served them right back up to us and forced us to comply. It is extraordinary, yet revealing, that it is only now, almost 90 years, since de Valera's 1937 constitution strapped us to the kitchen sink, that we are finally promised a referendum to get rid of the provision that gave state-sanctioned misogyny constitutional cover. Perhaps its timing is intended to give a sweet little coda to the remembrance decade, a final flourish too long, too shamefully delayed. But while part of this lecture will recount that story, of state-sanctioned oppression and EU-enabled liberation. It will also address that most unsettling of contemporary oppressions against women, and that is the violence directed against us by men, and particularly in the domestic arena. A violence so catastrophically present during COVID lockdown that on March 27, 2020, a bare 16 days after the UN had declared the pandemic, the organization was forced to raise the alarm to governments all over the world that violence within the hidden and claustrophobic lockdown home was already on the rise. And yes, men were affected too, and in increasing numbers, but the victims were overwhelmingly women and children. Violence against women, whether online, in the home or elsewhere, has become the new staging post for our endless, exhausting battle for equal rights. It is that threat that prevents us ever from inhabiting this world, from striding through this world, as men do, as equal human beings. It is that threat that inhibits the full actualization of our equal rights. A survey by the EU's Fundamental Rights Agency found that 83% of our young European women, those aged between 16 and 29, are daughters avoid certain situations and certain places for fear of being sexually or physically assaulted. A recent tweet by Nell Andrew, a UK-based literary agent, summed up the daily lived reality of that statistic for many women. She wrote, my husband just went for a run. It's 8 p.m., but he did it anyway. He felt entirely able to. It didn't occur to him he couldn't or what might happen if he did. It didn't occur to him to be afraid. That is all. The EU is currently debating a directive on violence against women and domestic violence. 
Its aim is to establish basic rules across all the EU member states with regard to definitions and sanctions related to violence against women, including rape and cyber violence, and to improve protection and support for the victims of gender-based violence. The degree to which the member states will support, oppose, or dilute the proposals it contains will not just determine the outcome, but will also provide a contemporary measure of our worth as women. The extent to which the EU considers that this issue merits the kind of extraordinary transformational intervention that has characterized the Union's growth and development since the Treaty of Rome in 1957. It will determine whether the EU has heard the words of European Parliament President Roberta Metzola, her plea to men to stop killing us and attempt to create a legal, social and political environment right across Europe where they, to the greatest extent possible, actually do stop killing and inflicting other forms of violence on us. For those of you interested in following this directive as it is debated, particularly at member state level through the Council, I would advise you to pay particular attention to the protestations on the Council side about the legal basis in the EU treaty that are so often the smokescreen for more substantive concerns. Contrary to the European Commission's assessment, there are concerns among member states that there is no sound legal basis for the EU to legislate on rape as one form of gender-based violence, even though the EU treaty lists sexual exploitation as one of those crimes for which the EU can establish common definitions and minimum sanctions, a so-called euro crime. I appreciate that there are concerns and sensitivities. I also appreciate that determining whether or not a legal basis exists isn't always straightforward, isn't always neatly legally black and white. Sometimes it is political will, political preference that may tilt the balance as between legal basis or no legal basis. So this is very much a space worth watching. I see a parallel between this issue and the equal pay and treatment issue that dominated the emerging social agenda of the EU in the 1970s, and so I will come back to it later. But I want first to reflect on what I referred to earlier on precisely how Ireland's entry to the EU in 1973 effectively gifted full Irish citizenship to the 50%, 51% who had been denied it. I should say at this point that the rest of the EU was hardly a feminist haven. Women in every EU state suffered discrimination at many levels, including marriage bars and the forced retreat from public life. There was nonetheless, in my view, an unmatched and particular genius in the manner in which Irish Catholic Church and Irish state collaborated so seamlessly as to render us pauperized in every sense. My first real inkling that I, as a woman, was living in a state that had legally, and in many other ways, hobbled me, came in 1968, five years before we joined what would become the European Union. I was 10 years old, in fifth class in national school in Dublin, and one day we were brought on a visit to the local Glen Abbey factory, which some of you, or your parents, may remember as a major clothing manufacturer, which at its peak employed over 1,000 people, most of them women, as the textiles industry was a largely all-female, low-pay ghetto. My memory is of rows of those women working the machines, but my clearest recollection, and to this day, well over 50 years later, I can still picture exactly where I was standing at that moment on that factory floor. My clearest recollection was of a woman working away at her own machine, but addressing our group and telling us what the peace rate was. That's P-I-E-C-E. -E. I don't know if the penny dropped then or dropped in hindsight, but at some point I realized that the school trip to the Glen Abbey factory was almost certainly a recruitment drive and mainly for the girls. I remember that moment so vividly because of how my 10 year old self reacted to the woman's words. I was startled, I was embarrassed, my sense of myself as bright and capable began to fracture as she spoke. I was a child, uncertain probably even of what a peace rate was, but the message I intuited from that visit 
was that as a female, this was my potential future. This was how my world, my state, viewed me as a woman. I didn't actually think I would ever work there, but my school had never brought us anywhere else apart from the enclosed Carmelite convent next door. We never did see the inside of the law library or indeed of Leicester House, though some of you might have. And then came the cavalry. That same year, Ireland's negotiations to join the EEC were intensifying. We were obviously desperate to get in, but not so desperate as to prevent the Irish negotiators from issuing behind closed doors squeaks of alarm over Article 119 of the Treaty of Rome, committing EEC members to accept the principle of equal pay for equal work between men and women. The promise of the 1916 proclamation committing a new Ireland to equality between the sexes had long since gone the way of those who had issued it. The gap between European treaty utopia and the dystopian reality of Irish women's lives was unimaginably large. The canvas of our lives was entirely painted by men. Collectively and individually, we were infantilized, degraded, deprived of financial and legal autonomy, expelled from the workplace on marriage, paid less, forbidden in effect to serve on juries, forbidden to collect even our children's allowance, denied any legal redress for marital rape, deemed, of course, to be a contradiction in terms. We had no right to share in the family home, were denied access to contraception, left to skivvy and to rot in Magdalen laundries, erased from public life unless a TD or senator, husband or father conveniently died, and we took the vacant seat, just as they and the This meeting is being them, recorded. This meeting is being streamed. We're never actually serious about the words of their very own proclamation. Any chance, whispered the Irish side, of delaying it for five years. For a time, the issue faded. The European side ignored the Irish request for a transitional period, and in 1973, we joined the EEC anyway. Nothing happened for a few years until foot dragging by a number of states, including Ireland, on the introduction of equal pay legislation prompted a directive compelling them to do so. And this is the point in the narrative where the penny begins to drop for Ireland, where the government starts to realise that membership goes way beyond the marketplace, the money, the grants, the loans, the benefits. The government starts to realise that it has actually signed up to a fledgling social Europe, where, mystifyingly, the faceless EU bureaucrats, and not itself, will come to breathe actual life into the discarded words of Pierce and Connolly and their fellow insurrectionists. It will be up to the faceless EU bureaucrats to protect the female citizens of this state, in effect from this state, and begin to restore to them a modicum, a modicum of the humanity that it, their own state, had trashed. This is also the point where the gap between politics Irish style and politics EU style also begins to emerge, where the pooling of sovereignty begins to bite. As chief negotiator, Fianna Fáil's Patrick Hillary had been happy to push the line on Ireland's allergic reaction to equal pay. But in January 1973, Hillary was appointed European Commissioner for Social Affairs, serendipitously at a point when both France and Germany had begun actively to push that fledgling social agenda. Later that year, the Fianna Fáil government was replaced by the Fine Gael Labour Coalition and any incentive there might have been for Hillary to continue to wear the green jersey was now well and truly gone. Our on Vian giving way to Ode to Joy. The government drafted legislation to give effect to the directive on equal pay, but the howling outrage of the employers unnerved it. There is no doubt but that the economy was under severe stress at that time. The degree, however, to which it would be further stressed by equal pay measures, which in any event would be challenging for women to access, given the legal acrobatics involved in defining equal across sectors, was questionable. The government sought and was refused a deferral. The Commission taking the opportunity to remind it that equal treatment of men and women is enshrined as a basic human right in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which the Commission was not prepared to ignore, whatever about the Irish government. It did nonetheless send a working party to Dublin to analyse the situation for itself and assess the economic implications of equal pay. 
The Working Party's report was lengthy, data-rich, and delightfully French bureaucrat in its understatement and verbal eye-rolling, essentially depicting the Irish case as back-of-an-envelope wishful thinking, untouched and untroubled either by coherent analysis or verifiable fact. That's actually in the document, you know, I'm not making this up. <laughs> but it's in French as well, it's even more beautiful. Anyway, Foreign Affairs Minister Gareth Fitzgerald, confident that he could save the day, approached Hillary, but met his match in the Commissioner's French legal advisor, who, after praising Fitzgerald's European credentials so highly that the minister was reportedly practically levitating, then remarked, and now you want to do this dreadful thing to women? Europe did not budge. It showed Ireland how any needed supports could be requested or acquired outside equal pay deferrals, and the seeds of Ireland's new European reality had been well and truly planted. To quote from another era, the boys were playing senior hurling now. The equal pay saga encapsulates for me the essence of the ideal, of the genius of the union. Employment equality rights were affected not by a state that had assiduously nurtured gender apartheid since its foundation, but by a body unmoored from the pressures of the parish pump and indeed of the Catholic Church. On this and on other issues, at its best, the union behaves as a neutral but ethical actor that gives life even to that which some of its component parts do not want to give life to. When it succeeds, it succeeds as though it is an entity that floats, if not entirely free from politics and sectoral interests, but is somehow, sometimes, magically detached from them. And now we are again in need of that magic. We are in need of a neutral ethical actor at a point in time when violence against women across the world has reached such levels that nothing short of collaborative and radical action can hope even to keep pace with it. And the European Union, as a powerful, ethical, global actor, needs to take that lead. Every single day, 137 women and girls across the world are killed by a family member or intimate partner. A woman or girl killed every 11 minutes in their own home. Six killed every hour by men around the world, mostly by those they intimately know. In the UK, a woman is killed by a man every three days. In the EU, two women are killed every day by an intimate partner or family member. In a recent address to the European Parliament, Irish MEP Francis Fitzgerald encapsulated it like this. Every 10 years, she said, a city the size of Marseille, Zagreb or Amsterdam disappears from the face of the earth as 850,000 women are murdered globally in what we call femicide, killing a woman because she is a woman. And what of Ireland? Many of you may have seen the Irish Times article last year detailing the killing of 239 Irish women by men between 1995 and last year, 2022, based on research and statistics compiled by Women's Aid, whose work over decades I so highly commend, as indeed I also commend the work of the National Women's Council of Ireland and all of those who have fought so hard to bring these issues from the margins to centre stage. So in preparing this lecture, I went through the Irish Times list, woman by woman, looking for patterns, struggling for insight. I looked at their ages, 41, 44, 86, 13, 61, 58, 28, 20, 70. A bell curve with most women killed in their 20s and early middle age, but with outliers of children and the very elderly. I looked at who had killed them. Random stranger, grandson, former friend, husband, neighbour, estranged husband, friend of son, husband, husband, local man, boyfriend, husband, ex-partner. A pattern repeated around the world, a majority killed by someone they know. I looked at how they had died. Strangled, knifed, stabbed in front of children, stabbed 66 times, shot, strangled, shot stabbed 99 times, kicked to death, strangled. Manners of death suffused with a cruelty that suggests levels of rage, of hatred, of misogyny, 
of entitlement and possessiveness that are terrifying, that demand a response that matches its force with equal, if not greater force. The clear-eyed determination of it, the EEC of 50 years ago, to force through what some of its own member states did not wish, equal pay and equal treatment of women, is again necessary to face down and triumph over those forces that have yet to comprehend or are indifferent to the nature of the crimes of violence against women. The fact that it is essentially their gender that has determined that this violence should be rained down upon them. The Directive on Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence has been sought yet blocked for many years, and it is a credit to Commission President von der Leyen that she has brought it finally to the table. The European Parliament is currently dealing with amendment proposals with Irish MEP Francis Fitzgerald as one of the two strong Parliament leads or rapporteur on the, director, on the directive. The Council, that is the Member States, is expected to give its opinion in June, but sounding suggest an amount of pushback from many Member States. The reasons vary from concerns about EU overreach into the area of criminal law to classic power balance sensitivities between the Commission and the Member States, to political and cultural opposition from some Conservative Member States to such an overtly gendered piece of proposed legislation. Several EU states still refuse to ratify the Council of Europe's Istanbul Convention on Violence Against Women, and while the European Court of Justice has ruled that the EU can ratify it without their acceptance, that ratification is still awaited. The harmonization of definitions is challenging. Many member states, for example, still require the use of force, threats or coercion for the crime of rape. Other member states, including commendably Ireland, solely rely on the condition that the victim has not consented to the sexual act. Only the latter approach, according to the directive, quote, achieves the full protection of the sexual integrity of victims. This is now a race against the electoral clock. The European Parliament elections will be held next year. By the time the next legislative cycle begins with a new commission, more conservative states, such as Hungary, will be presiding over the Council, with the power to speed up, slow down, or simply ignore legislative files. There is probably just a nine-month window before this directive begins to lose momentum. Ireland does not, and will not, I think, until 2026, hold the presidency of the Council. But that does not mean that we cannot act, that we cannot be the ethical actor in this arena. In recent years, through referendums and legislation, we have done much to introduce positive change in the areas of gender equality and violence against women, including through the recognition of coercive control as a crime. We need to move this positive momentum onto the European level. And to do this, we need to believe, to internalize, that we have the power to do this because already we exert an executive and soft power in the EU that defies our population size. The many positions we currently hold show that Ireland and Irish people are capable of attracting power, are capable of exerting influence and are seen as trusted players within the legal, executive and political architecture of the EU. Later this year, I presume that the referendum to repeal the women in the home constitutional provision will be held. And I also presume that it will be repealed or amended to reflect the contemporary reality of caring in this state. But how much more meaningful, how much more powerful it would be if this state, through its not inconsiderable weight, also behind this directive, championed the passage of its most vital provisions, persuaded its opponents to come on board, and ultimately use this as its way of rolling back the years, of going some way to undoing the damage it inflicted for so many decades on so many women. The denial of life chances, of family, of independence, even of life itself. Let this be our practical, tangible way of celebrating EU 50 by gifting back to the EU just a tiny part of what the EU has gifted to us. Thank you for your attention.
you so much. That was incredible. Thank you. Um, and just if anyone wants to tweet about uh, today's lecture, the hashtag is Ireland EU 50. I forgot to mention that at the start. Um, and I just want to ask you a little bit about, I mean, this was the last part you were talking about there, about the EU representing a transformation for Irish women. Does it still do that for, you know, at the moment for, I suppose, women now, but also other member states that have come in? Because as you mentioned there, six million states haven't ratified the Istanbul Convention. There is a lot of protestations and growing authoritarianism in Hungary and Poland around women's rights. Does it still represent that? Well, I mean, I, I think, as I understand it, part of the reason why the Commission went, went ahead and, and, uh, and proposed this directive was precisely because member states, not all of them were signing up the Istanbul Convention, which is held to be the gold standard in relation to combating violence against women. And, um, you know, actually, just before I came here, I was reading an interview that Frances Fitzgerald had given, and she said, for example, that there are 16 member states who do not want rape to be included as part of the, the, the definition as, as a euro crime. And I'm sure there are all sorts of nice legal reasons why that is the case, but I think we need to go beyond that and see, uh, absolutely see the bigger picture. I suppose, you know, as ombudsman, um, a lot of the work I deal with is, you know, people trying to find out what's going on. You know, everybody in the EU has a, has a treaty-based right to take part in the democratic life of the Union. But as I often say, you can only do that if you know what's going on in the first place. So I suppose the least transparent institution is the Council. It still it is a legislative body, just as the Parliament is, um, and yet it, it, in many ways, still acts as kind of a more of a diplomatic body. So everything's done behind closed doors, and deals are done, and so on and so forth. And I can understand that when you're trying to get 27 member states uh, together to to agree on something, I can understand why that sometimes is necessary. But in relation to this directive, for example, we don't know what the conversations are behind closed doors. You know, we don't actually know probably what individual member states are doing. We, you know, we, we, we hear it and people like the MEPs who are involved in this would, would be picking things up and so on uh, in, in the Brussels bubble and so on. But because a lot of that is, is quite opaque, we don't know. So unless we know, we can't uh, intervene, we can't lobby, we can't, we can't deal with it. So I, I think that's why, you know, when I was thinking about this and I was going to go back to the 70s and equal pay and so on. And then I was reflecting on on this directive. And I suppose that Irish Times article really affected me as well. And the death of Savita Halbanava really affected me as well, because that was, you know, inertia by the state that allowed certain things not to be dealt with. And that, that's what so there were a lot of things coming together. But I, I do see this particular directed as important in relation to this whole issue about full equality for women. Um, I mean, it doesn't deal just with rape, it deals with cyber violence, it deals with, you know, how women can protect themselves and their families and all of that, it deals with a, with a range of issues. But a lot of them are still sensitive because in a lot of countries there isn't still that sort of embedded real sense of equality. It may be there on paper, but it's not there culturally, you know, yeah. and I think it's this cultural thing that that is being reflected probably in the uh, in the conversation between the member states and in this issue about the legal basis when people talk about the legal basis you really do need to look behind that to see what is actually stopping this from happening yeah because you meant you mentioned that you know the commission kind of pushed back on ireland around equal pay but um you know there is obviously a wide margin of appreciation when it comes to cultural issues so the eu never really got involved when it came to abortion or, or the european convention courts never did either but is the Commission strong enough? I mean, you mentioned Ursula von der Leyen bringing this directive. Is it strong enough to push back against those, you know, cultural issues? When you're talking about something that should be as simple as rape. Yeah, well, the Commission, you know, you, you need an alliance to push things through. No one institution can do it by itself. I mean, in relation to equal pay, I mean, in a sense, we got lucky because, I mean, that that was written explicitly into, into the treaty, whereas other social issues were not. So you had something very tangible to go on. And the reason that it was written into the treaty was not really some big feminist whatever by 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 the member states, but because a number of them had signed up the International Labour Organization standards, which included equal pay. And the French in particular were afraid that if Ireland got in and you know cheap labour there in the form of you know it's, it's women, then there would be an unequal playing field in relation to that. So it was an economic piece rather than that. But it was there, and just those equal pay, equal treatment, whatever the words were, were enough for 
over, and you know, it didn't happen overnight, but over the next couple of decades for the ECJ to rule, to interpret that, and also for other directives to come on board uh, to uh, sort of fill in, fill in the gaps in relation to the equal treatment. I mean, I think there were seven directives in total that, um, you know, that, that dealt with, in general, equal treatment of women. But so equal pay was written down, it was there, and it was unavoidable. But, you know, you have sexual exploitation. So some countries might say, well, yes, well, of course, rape is sexual exploitation and as well. Well, no, it isn't. And then you have the different definitions of rape. Well, there has to be coercion. She needs to push back. Well, no, in our country, for example, if, if the woman did not consent, uh, then that is rape. Uh, so you, you can see where all of this, but then you see, you know, there's a cultural bedrock as well in relation to this. So it's wherever you are culturally in relation to women is probably going to determine whether or not you think there's a legal basis for all of these things. But I mean, do you see progress essentially you know, on this issue? Because it, look, it, it feels like there's a rollback when you look at what's happening in places like Poland around abortion. There's unfortunately severe health and average happening, happening in Poland. You know, there are women who are losing their lives because of, uh, there's no intervention for them around abortion. And you're absolutely right. I mean, that's another very sensitive touchstone. And you're right. I mean, I have read, I'm sure you have as read, cases which mirror that of Savitas that have happened in, in, in Poland. And um, you had a case even in Malta recently where a, a woman tourist, uh, if I recall, had a uh, needed to have her pregnancy terminated because she was, you know, going to die if not, and she had to be airlifted out of, of Malta in order in order to, to do that. You see what's happening in in the in the United States as well. So so certainly um, certainly there there is a back a backlash, and and abortion is one of those issues that nobody wants to you know touch. I mean, you may recall in the 1990s. Um, after the uh, after long after you know the anti-abortion um, amendment had been put in the constitution, the Irish government rather quietly went over to its counterparts, its member states, and said, "Would you mind?" This was the Treaty of Maastricht was coming up, and the forces that had enabled and pushed through uh, the abortion referendum and campaigned against divorce and all of that, they were very concerned that the Maastricht referendum would allow abortion in as part of internal market services or whatever. And so um, the Irish government went and whispered into the ears of its council, you know, allies and said, can we have a protocol that says, you know, don't touch uh, whatever. And, and that happened. And people didn't really know about it. But then, of course, ironically, when, when the Supreme Court ruled that actually abortion was legal in Ireland, then they got really confused about the protocol. What exactly was it trying to protect? So, you know, what I'm saying is that 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 is really sensitive. Uh, and, and you can understand the sensitivities around that. Uh, rape to me is sort of different. Rape is obvious, it's violent, it's lack of consent. The fact that there should be such discussion around it uh, is, is uh, yeah, is troubling. Um, just before I move on to the, the audience, I mean, could talk us through what, how we think um, Ireland has, or, or the EU has transformed the lives of women in, in, you know, in Ireland over the past 50 years. Besides the UK, obviously. Well, yeah, of course it has. I mean, you know, we, we have now gained entry to probably every every role bar the Taoiseach. Um, who knows what might happen next? Um, so, yeah, I mean, we are free. We, we, we you know, are highly educated. I mean, one of the issues as well is that degree to which how, how well women do in education, you know, uh, compared sometimes uh, to men. We, we have those opportunities, we have those, those possibilities. But we also have our families and trying to balance those. And I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes when the EU clicks its fingers, things happen as in the equal pay thing, not immediately, but eventually, you know, you wish they could equally inter intervene in something like childcare. You know, I mean, my children are now grown up, but, you know, in the 1990s when I had them and then trying to work and juggle with them, even with a with a wonderfully supportive uh, partner, it was still enormously difficult, enormously expensive. You know, you, you felt you were never doing any any job to the best of your capacity. So, I mean, unless there's a cultural acceptance that, you know, in order for women to, to, to work and to have that public role, um, looking after children, all of that needs to be seen as a public good not just a private good, it has to be seen as a public good. And some countries in Europe do see this as, as a public good and, and you know, uh, and, and act accordingly. But, but in Ireland, we're, we're still in 
in between and I meet young women now with children and they, they still have the same problems trying to find childcare for their kids, trying to afford it, trying to juggle all of that. So, you know, again, we haven't yet in this country, even though we have done a lot of great things, I, I absolutely do admit that, uh, you know, internalized this this particular uh, cultural issue. They're, they're still a feeling that, that that's your role and somehow muddle along, you know. There's lots of people who want to talk, uh, ask some questions. So, um, uh, Alda Smith. <laughs> And um, oh, one thing and another. Emily, first of all, can I say thank you for a really wonderful uh, speech. I've absolutely warmed my heart and also for your personal uh, memories. Um, I knew Glen Abbey well myself and really take your point. Um, and, and also, I'm really particularly appreciative. I happen at the moment to have the privilege of being chair of Women's Aid. So to say thank you to you for really expressing that's quite with a sense of real urgency, the importance of Ireland using its influence, hard or soft, whatever kind of influence it is, to put it behind this really important directive, which is uh, so important, not least because, of course, violence against women is one of the great barriers against our achieving the equality that you speak about so so very eloquently. So I do want to say thank you because your voice counts for a great deal. It means a lot and I know that it will be, be heard. I also want to pick up on, on a couple of points and I'll do it very briefly that um, uh, Shona and yourself have just been talking about. I am so pleased to see this directive on violence almost there, but it has taken 45 years or whatever since, um, since our own joining uh, 50 years ago. But I can't really ever quite get my head around the fact that reproductive and sexual rights have not yet been seen as a hugely crucial area uh, for an EU directive, precisely because, of course, this is also one of the great barriers to our equality, along with childcare and those violence, reproductive rights, reproductive and sexual rights and childcare are the three areas where I think we need directives on all three of these and never less than at the present moment when the far right extremists and indeed not even so far to the right are absolutely turning their face against um, equality for women and for LGBTIQ people and many others. But I want to say a really very big thank you uh, to you. Well done and may you forge ahead. Um, I, sh I should say when I came here today, I, I knew what I was going to talk about and nobody else did, apart from my, my colleagues. And um, I, I was thinking, well, I hope Alva's here today. And then, then when, when, when I came in, somebody said, Al Alva Smith is here and uh, she hopes that you're going to talk about women. So. <laughs> This is this perfect uh, this perfect marriage. But yes, I mean, again, just just reflecting on like when 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 the, when the EU wants to do something, when there is a huge push, it 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 will happen. And and I'm just hoping that. Um, but you know, we we need to see what's going on with the member states as well. We need to be able to, to push there because the Commission has you know it, it's very strong piece. The Parliament, I, I assume, will come out. I mean, there are thousands of amendments down. Let me tell you, it's it's a huge piece of work. Uh, as I said, the council is supposed to come out with its thinking, but I understand that it, it's 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 legal advice so far is not exactly you know popping up and down with excitement at the prospect of this directive becoming a becoming a reality. Yes, Jean Cook. Can I thank you for bringing the speech across just the voice of? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the voice of a fantastically experienced. European official, but also the woman who wrote Masterminds of the Right all those years ago, a book that we were just saying earlier still stands up after all these years as a, a very important warning as to what can happen uh, when civic society organizations decide to do the kinds of things that those people did. Just two things I wanted to comment on. First, the, there's no doubt whatever, and I think most of us here in this room would share your opinion that joining the EU made a huge difference to Irish women, not least the equal pay and the abolition of the marriage bar. 
<laughs> there are young women today when I mentioned to them that you had to give up your job when you got married who look at me as if I'm from some age of the dinosaurs. This couldn't possibly have happened. And yet it did not that long ago. But we shouldn't forget that everything starts with ideas. You know that more than most people. And the second wave of feminism gets going in Ireland in the 1960s, before we know that we're going to be into the EU. You look at people like Eileen Proctor, who got widows' pensions for women. You look at wonderful people like uh, Hilda Tweedy, who was highly instrumental in creating the Committee on the Status of Women that reported in 1972 on a large number of issues that mattered to women. You look at the fantastic noise made by the Irish Women's Liberation Movement, and particularly their trip to Belfast on the contraceptive train in 1971, that raised consciousness and got everyone thinking about it. You look at the amazing organizations set up in the 1970s, like Women's Aid, of which Alva is chair, the Rape Crisis Center, AIM, Cherish, all of these organizations were hugely important. That's something to be proud of. And that was done by Irish women themselves. At the other end of it, I'm so pleased that you are taking an active part in trying to promote the Directive on Violence Against Women. Um, I am the chair of an organization called SAIL, which uh, it exists in the North Inner City to help women with addiction problems. You mentioned lockdown and violence. We had about, say, 100 women on our books at the time that lockdown came. We had to go and visit them outside their houses at social distance to make sure they were surviving the tsunami of domestic violence that was coming down the path to them. It really seriously affects poor women disproportionately in the most awful ways. And it brought it home to me at any rate that this was much, much bigger than, than most of us suspect. But uh, Alva and I are also on the advisory group for the We Consent Project, which has been spearheaded by the Rape Crisis Centre, uh, and is uh, a program of education and advocacy for the idea of consent. Uh, there are marvelous badges saying we consent that you can give to everybody. I often get asked by men, what can I do to make it clear that I'm against violence against women? And they are, they were our allies in feminism, they can be our allies in this too. The answer to that is wear the badge, just wear the badge. It'll start conversations it will get things going. There's a huge campaign of advertising going on about that at the moment. You talk about a change in culture, and you're absolutely right about that. This is one way to try to, to achieve that change in the culture in this country. A lot of complaints, for example, exist about the sort of talk that goes on in sporting organizations about women. How do we change that? Wear the badge, start the conversation. We need brave men to come forward and deal with this issue as much as we need brave women. Um, thank you so much for, for your lecture today. I would love to get a copy of it at some stage because I'd love to quote it in various things that I'll be talking about in the future. The very best of luck with, with everything you're doing in Europe. Thank you. Um, I agree with you so much about the, the, the involvement of the women. There was a beautiful symbiosis, really, the, the activism of women in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. And so at the same time that, that um, Gareth Fitzgerald was running over to Brussels, women were going to Brussels as well and getting the ear. Irish women were going and getting the ear of, of the Commission as well. And, and that, that was hugely important. Um, but when you talk about, about men there, when I was talking to somebody in relation to this some time ago, I said, you know, what, what's missing in this is, is the voices of men. And, and she thought I meant, you know, men like men in this room or men in politics or whatever. But I actually mean the voices of men who are perpetuating this violence. Because, and it's a problem not just, you know, male violence against women, but male violence against males. What, what is it? You know, when I was, as I said, when I was going down that Irish Times piece and the, I mean, I sat down and did the thing, you know, uh, ages and how and all of this. And then, and then I had another piece for like, why? And very often the, when trials happen, the men don't talk, you know, the probably advised don't, don't say anything. So there's very little will come out. Sometimes it would be, she provoked me or something. But what happens at that moment? I mean, I knew one of the women who was in that list and, um, uh, you know, she she was killed by her husband, and so I knew them. They were the local mom, the dad. It, it, like, there was nothing different. So, what what is it uh, in 
you know, Alva's dying to, uh, <laughs> to tell me that. Power, I know, I know, power. But actually, it's funny, I was reading as well about, I was kind of looking at, at you know, well, where, 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 you know, where are there better outcomes? And I'm thinking Scandinavia got to be equality, whatever. No, there's a thing called the Scandinavian paradox, the Swedish paradox, in which actually the more women have gained equality and the higher they have risen, then there's been a, there's been a backlash. So the figures are even better there. So I think that's a piece of work that has to be done uh, as well, you know, mm -hmm. and that's why it is important. Uh, but the other point, you know, men just taking part in the conversation. I remember Jess, is it Jess Phillips, the, the MP in the UK? She stood up last year and she read out the list of names mm -hmm. of the women who had been killed by men. And she commented on how, how few men were in, were in the chamber. It has to be a collective effort. They're, they're, they're daughters too, you know, and all of that. So that's important. This lady here is a Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Emily, for a really fantastic speech. Uh, my name is Sinead Gibney. I'm the Chief Commissioner for the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. Um, we work very closely with our colleagues in, the, in Northern Ireland, the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission um, on the protection of rights on an all-island basis. Uh, and we just launched some research on the divergence of rights. I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on the role of the Irish government uh, and, and Europe in the current context now where we are seeing a potential divergence of rights, we have seen UK commitments obviously in the Windsor framework to the protection of those rights, um, but a, a situation where with that potential divergence and the threat to peace that we're seeing, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts from your office in particular and from Brussels, I suppose, um, to, to what those different roles are and how we can make sure that as an island, we continue to enjoy the same protections and rights at both sides of our border. Yeah, uh, well, actually, actually, Ireland um, uh, uh, has some interesting, actually, roles in all of this. I mean, the head of the Fundamental Rights Agency is Michael O'Flaherty, who was uh, the head of the Human Rights Agency, I think, in Northern Ireland, was he? And also you have uh, Sheikha O'Leary, uh, who, who spoke, I think, at his last lecture. He's now the, the president of the, of the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, you, you see a lot of Irish people in this general human rights uh, you know, arena. Um, and so, you know, as I said earlier, it's, it's a question of finding our voice and it's a question of being very, uh, as I said, you know, internalizing the power that, that, that we do have and that we can have. Um, and, you know, I, I, I see, you know, the work that, that, that these people do. I see, as I said earlier, the, the respect that, that Irish actors and politicians or uh, people in the administration, the respect that, that they have. Um, and, and I think sometimes when I see Ireland in kind of league tables, we're always about kind of the bottom of the first third. You know, we're kind of, nobody can say, but you can't point and say we're, we're really poor at this. You can't say we're brilliant at it either. I mean, I think we really need to up our game, you know. And I think this reflection on, on EU50 and what we've got from it, I think we need to reflect now on how we, as the powerful force we are, because I believe that if you believe you're powerful, then you can be powerful and see that, but also see what issues we really want to impact on. And that's why I think, you know, just going not entirely to your point, but going back to this, this directive, there's no reason why Ireland can't take the lead in this. And there's no reason why Ireland can't be open about where it stands. I don't want to put the minister in the spot there. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and act, act accordingly. Uh, and not always be the sort of the, 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 the good boys and girls, you know, and sitting back and, and not ruffling any feathers. I think we do need to ruffle a few feathers. And I mean, I noticed as well, I was reading this morning, there's a thing called Coco's Law, which was a legislation that was affected in relation to cyber bullying or, yeah, where, uh, and this was started by a mother whose daughter was so harassed on social media that she took her own life. So into a coercive control and that Ireland has taken a lead. So why not, you know, transplant? that onto Europe, not to be, not to be afraid to do so, to really feel that power and, and use it for good. Hi, Emily, Joe Deering, Irish Ombudsman. Thank you very much for a very powerful presentation. And you've outlined uh, the, the, I suppose, the progress we've made, albeit kicking and screaming sometimes, and you're rightly focused on how much further we need to go. Do you have any concerns about slippage of what we've already achieved uh, here in Ireland and indeed 
across the EU? Because that's something I think Concerns we, uh, slippage. slippage. In other words, could we go backwards in any respect? Is there a risk well, of losing what we have? The Atlantic and see how, how you know, or even or even in the UK in relation to to standards as well, and the erosion of of institutions, public institutions, and so on. Uh, that that we've seen, we've seen how quickly it can happen, uh, and that that's why you know part of, of my role. Uh, as ombudsman is to make sure, as I say, to, to help the institutions to be their own best selves. I mean, you know, from, you know, obviously from, from my speech, you can see how passionate I am about Europe, what it's enabled me to do. And therefore, I have seen and felt its power, you know. Um, uh, but I, I know that, you know, something I, I, I read recently, but I did plagiarize from something else. So it was like, um, you can only have, uh, you need moral authority to have political legitimacy. And so I get a lot of complaints, say, about, you know, from the Commission. The Commission is the big beast in the jungle. That's why we get a lot of complaints about it. We get complaints in relation to revolving doors, issues, conflicts of interest, ethical breaches, and so on. And of their own, they don't seem like a big deal. But if you let those slide, then you're going to wake up and you're going to have a Trump there, or you're going to have, you know, something as what's happened to, to the UK political and administrative culture, which is so damaging to the people. And... Um, I think you mentioned uh, you know, Cattergate uh, at, at, at the start, and you know we've been doing well, the work we've been doing. Cattergate relates more to giving advice to the Commission and the Parliament about what a good ethics body would look like. Uh, but I mean, for me, unless the public trust that the EU administration has the highest possible standards, then that allows in the voices of the Eurosceptics and those who are hostile. To Europe. I mean, some years ago we did an investigation into how the Commission handled the decision of former Commission President Barroso to go to Goldman Sachs after he had stepped down. And this was not that long after the financial crisis, and the uh, Goldman Sachs had been, you know, fined, you know, for the way it had uh, enabled the uh, the crisis in the in the U.S. and also what it had done in Greece. Uh, and so, um, you know, people seeing the head of this big institution that they need to have to, going to Goldman Sachs was, you know, and the, the people who actually complained to us were the people who work in the commission themselves, because they saw, because they have that, that pride and that great public service ethic and so on. So once it begins to slip, you know, their danger lies. And, you know, with Cattergate, I was asked at the beginning, well, you know, when Cattergate happened, everybody came out and everybody was saying, shock, horror, this is terrible, and awful, and we do this, that, and the other to, to fix it. But it's kind of died down a little bit now, you know, and I can't, well, maybe, and I know that, like in Parliament, uh, President Metzler is getting a lot of pushback from, you know, various... Uh, various elements of, of, of that parliament, and she's having some difficulty in getting together a, a set of proposals that, you know, match what people, European citizens, should expect to have. I mean, for example, at the beginning, she proposed that there would be a cooling off period of two years for MEPs before they started lobbying, huge thing in Brussels, as you know. When that emerged, finally, it was six months, you know. So, uh, I mean, I know you know, I get sick of myself talking about this sometimes, but it's only because I have such faith and trust in the EU, because I find it is such, so necessary, has been so necessary um, to all of our lives, but is also necessary in the world today, when there are so many bad actors, you need the EU to be there at the top of its game and as ethical as it possibly can be. And do you believe that, that the institutions are strong enough to protect, I suppose, against another Cattergate or like that with Barossa. I mean, even though the rules are there, everyone knows that Cattergate would have been wrong. It was almost a caricature of a corrupt situation where an MEP, a vice president of the European Parliament, you know, is taking money from Qatar, or potentially taking money from Qatar. And similarly with Barroso going to Goldman Sachs, he would have known that wasn't a very good look. That the institution is strong enough to think, given as well, next year we have European Parliament elections, we don't know how Europe is going to swing. Well, I remember when Boris Johnson uh, crashed and burned as, as, as Prime Minister and leaving the trail that he left behind him in terms of trashed institutions and so on. Um, people were asked why they had supported him in the first place and a lot of people supported him and a lot of people, I mean, a huge majority. You know. And I remember people would say, well, we know he lies and we know he does this and we know he does it, but that's baked in. In other words, we just cast that aside. 
And that's really scary because when you have all of that baked in, then you are accepting, you know, lies. You're accepting corruption. You're kind of saying, but sure, sure, that happens, that happens, that happens. What's the big deal? And people would ask me, was I surprised by Cattergate? Well, you know, yes and no. Um, I mean, it was very quite stunning, really, because you saw the actual bags of cash in the actual suitcases, which was amazing, courtesy of the Belgian authorities. Thank you for your transparency, boys and girls. Um, but um, also when you saw the impunity, you know, the, when you saw the fact that, OK, loads of rules there, but they were not being adhered to by the MEPs. I mean, there was a very funny, well, funny uh, graph in, in Le Soir, a Belgian newspaper. And some of this arose, you know, MEPs, if they are Hey, if they're given hospitality or free flights from from you know another entity, you're supposed to register it, okay? Um, and so they did this chart of the registering of, let's say, we call it free flights, just as a, a, a generic way of calling it, between January and December of last year. Now, Cattergate happened, I think, around the first week of December. So January to November, you have a complete flat line. December. Whoosh, everybody rushed to uh, register there now. and all that says is that they didn't think it was any big deal if they didn't you know so now things are being tightened up and one of the things that uh, president Metzler uh, by the parliament is introducing is that before when MEP stepped down they would have a badge for life they could just wander in and out and therefore they're free to lobby and whatever and be you know do things undercover, so to speak. But now um, MEPs will have to get a daily badge. If they're not lobbying, they get a particular badge. But if they are lobbying, i.e. if they are on the transparency register, they have to get a badge that basically says, I am a lobbyist. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's quite as explicit as that. But, but that. And then there will be penalties uh, if, if they are. So that is something. You know, um, but we never want to get to a, a, a place where you're complacent or that happens. There's politicians. Actually, when I, I launched my, uh, I had a, a press conference last week um, to launch my annual report. And there was one journalist, uh, I can't remember where he was from, but he was saying, we we're talking about categories. Does anybody really care? I mean, this sort of stuff goes on, blah, 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 blah. You know, does anybody, nobody really wants to read my stuff. I can't remember where it was came from. Anyway, a Swedish or Dan a Danish journalist said, we care very much in Denmark about, about what happens because we have very high expectations of our public administration and our public servants and our politicians and what they can't do, can or can't do. So my advice was for him to move to Denmark, you know, but 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 to so cheer him up. I felt sorry for him; his soul was crushed. But um, but I kind of think that's interesting, and it was like really uplifting. Oh, okay, in that country, you actually really have high standards. That's fantastic. It's not all the same. Nobody's all the same. And that's what we should be constantly seeking, and particularly from the EU, because of the role it plays, not just within the EU, but globally as a software and hardware. And transparency was another issue, of course. You have criticised Ursula von der Leyen for not um, disclosing the text messages between her and the chief executive of Pfizer as well. Do you think that the Commission has learned from that issue? Or and do you, how would you rate transparency in relation to the Commission? Well, I know the Commission has worked very well with us, and I'm looking at a Commission person there, so I will uh, <laughs> has worked very well with us uh, after after the, uh, uh, the the von der Leyen piece to, to try and get ground rules in relation to you know how you capture social media and text you know, as they relate to business and so on. But the but the the um, the President von der Leyen case, I think, was um, was a lost opportunity. Like, look, I. What happened? You know what happened. We were Europe was doing a deal with AstraZeneca, that was kind of falling through because AstraZeneca had overpromised to the UK and underpromised to us or underdelivered to us. So, and at that time, and this was around April twenty twenty one, I think. So tens of thousands of people had died. People were ill. The whole economy is disrupted. We were desperate. We had no vaccine. We were desperate to get a vaccine. I mean, she was absolutely right, in my view, to go to whoever was there and could, you know, stick the needles in her arms. Yeah, absolutely fine. And had she come out at the time and said, OK, so I didn't do everything by the book, so I didn't dot the I's and cross the T's, but it was kind of like, you know, hit me with the baby in my arm sort of thing. Um, and, you know, she, I think she would have, she, that, that would have been a good communication piece for her, but that didn't happen. To this day, um, they have, I mean, we did an investigation, they effectively stonewalled us, they said, well, you know, short-lived messages are from documents, yes, they are, uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, and, and it has hung over the commission 
for um, now for, for 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 several years, and um, you know that's a pity because it can and it can be abused obviously by people who want to do damage to to the European Union, um, and um, you know also. Yeah, it's it's it, it's obscured some of the very good work that that the Commission and the Union has has done as a more generally. Yeah, because that's just one question for me, just on the, com the communication piece, because you mentioned you know the ninety seven three was Ireland's independence day, um, but then when you look at Brexit, Brexiteers were saying leaving the EU was Independence Day, and um, and people didn't maybe I don't know ascertain or understand enough the UK about how important the EU was to their lives. And that can happen potentially here. Maybe though we do have huge support for the EU membership. You never know what could happen. There is groups in in Ireland who would like to see leaving the EU. How can the EU better communicate? You know uh, what it actually does for people. I mean, the vaccines uh, issue is obviously very important because we got vaccines in the end, and it actually worked really well. Ireland would have had very few vaccines if we didn't have the collaborative effect. Yet people think, well, there's a lack of transparency. There has to be something uh, underhanded there. Well, I, I think I think Ireland. I think it'd be a long time before Ireland started to sour on the EU somehow or other. Um, um, I, th I think I think actually in recent years people are feeling the EU more in their lives, and I think they, they certainly felt it during the, the the COVID crisis. I think they're they're seeing it even in relation to the the, the EU response to um, Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine. They saw it with the roaming charges, um, you know, all of these things. And I remember talking to the Portuguese ombudswoman actually during the height of COVID and um, the commission had, um, you know, like in, in the matter of weeks uh, with, with the council to create, I think it was called the Sure Fund. And this basically meant that people weren't going to starve when they lost their jobs or couldn't work, you know, during, uh, during COVID. And it was a remarkable, we actually gave it an award. Um, uh, it was an incredible piece of work. And I was talking to the, uh, your, uh, the Portuguese ombudswoman and she mentioned how people were aware of that in Portugal and kind of tends to be rare that people always are aware of what the EU does. And she says, it is the first time she said that the Portuguese people have really felt Europe in their lives. You know, it's, it's been there, yeah. you know, obviously seeping through probably so many elements of their lives, but that made it really real to them. And, and I actually think that, that the crises have actually um, cemented people's uh, allegiance to the to the EU. I don't mean allegiance and sort of to the flag or whatever, but their recognition of what a positive force it is. And I think a lot of people in the UK are also waking up to that. I suppose with the COVID fund as well, it was almost the exact opposite almost the, of what happened during the banking crisis where you had in, the imposition of austerity with the situation in Greece and people just being, you know... Well, I mean, uh, well, the EU learned an awful lot from yeah. that. Don't do it that way. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Don't take money away from them. Give them money. Yeah, you know they learned a lot from that. I mean the the troika. I mean although I mean I think some of us were glad to see the the, the troika coming in and running the country. But anyway, but they learned a lot from that. I mean that, that was that was it was bad politics. It was just it was cruel politics in some ways, you know. Uh, but I and I think therefore how the the way in which COVID was dealt with a very different crisis in some ways, but it still spoke to everybody's bread and butter lives. You know, am I going to work? Am I going to get money? Ah, da, 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 da. I think the EU was seen and it had learned, as I said, from the financial crisis in terms of um, what it uh, what it shouldn't do. Just before I ask any for any closing remarks, does anyone have any comment or uh, question they'd like to? Oh, yes. I just uh, moving away from the commission and transparency. Um, I, you mentioned the council being very uh, a very impenetrable um, organization, and I was wondering if you had any ideas about what you would change. For example, I'm not sure. Coming back to your violence against women, uh, the, the proposal for the directive. I'm not sure that across Europe, women know the positions of their governments on these issues, uh, on who takes stand where, et cetera. So I was wondering, you know, what, 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 what in your dream world would you like to see happen for the council becoming a more uh, open and transparent uh, yeah. institution? I at certain points in, in the in sorry in the life cycle of a of a of a directive uh, while it is being discussed, we need to know 
what is being discussed. I mean, we did a big investigation into council transparency some years ago, and, and we asked for two simple things. One, that not every single document be stamped limite, like secret, 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 and also that the position of the member states be recorded. Maybe not released, you know, immediately, but recorded. I mean, if you take this directive, let's say we had at this point in time, because if, if, if the council is going to decide in, in June, we're getting, that's next month, wouldn't it be nice to know now? Well, Ireland thinks this, Sweden thinks that, Hungary that, blah, 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 and assess it. I mean, that, that's, that is the essence of a democracy, you know? Um, and, and then we, we intervene. But what happens is it becomes, it becomes opaque, or, or what is noted down is not Ireland said this, Sweden said that, but a group of countries disagreed with, or whatever. So it can be very hard to get, as you know, that information. And while it, I am accepting of the fact that it's very hard to get agreement, and you see, then that leads to blockages as well. There's no agreement, so the file is just left there. It's just left sit. And, you know, Sweden, who has the next uh, council presidency? Spain, is it? Yeah, and I think Spain is quite progressive in relation to some of its equality. And uh, so, I mean, that's a possibility. Um, Hungary takes over, I think, the end of 2024. You know, um, that's tricky. That, that, that's why there is, you know, a, a shelf life uh, for this director. But I think raising awareness of it, and I even wasn't that aware of it until I started talking to people in Parliament and really started taking an interest in it. It's shown by spending half my speech talking about it, you know, because it, it is really important. And I do link it to what happened 50 years ago. Let's put that same push behind it. You know? Yeah, and just on that note, Emily, I suppose we've had 50 years. What do you see happening in the next five years in relation to women, particularly, well, I don't think we'll have an enlarged EU by in five years' time, but we, we, we're looking in that direction. Um, well, you know, I, I see positive things happening in, in this country in, in relation to the, the criminalisation of, of certain um, acts which would not have been considered criminal before. And I think I think that's excellent. And that's why we have the capacity um, to uh, influence. Uh, and we shouldn't be afraid to do that. I mean, we, we do, of course, you see pushback. You know, you see what's happening in Poland. Malta also has a very conservative regime and, and, and all of that. And, and a lot of the... A lot of the conservative authoritarian leaders, you know, get their power from this, you know, push against uh, equality in relation to trans rights, in relation to women, in relation to LGBTI, and so on. That's where they get their power from, and that that that's terrifying. So, I mean, I'm always an optimist, but I think unless we keep pushing, and unless countries with the moral authority that Ireland has push and not be afraid and not see ourselves as the, you know, the little people at the back afraid to, to, to show our voice. We should really, really embrace this uh, and, and, and push it because I do really believe that we, that we have the power to do so. Yeah. Emily O'Reilly, thank you very much for coming here today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's what we have.